questions from you. And can I, um, Corey and, where's Corey? I can see where Adrian is. Corey's got, so one of you needs to go over the other side of the room. Wherever it is. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, Stuart. I mean, you you stuck my mind. <laughs> okay, well, that was a fantastic talk, and thank you very much. It's up there, so far as I'm concerned, with Al Gore's movie. But um, in, in terms of uh, the power of what it's, it's presenting, but I do have one quarrel. Uh, you're talking about um, that set of words. To me, the important thing is uh, it, for, for people like myself in a Western society, is learning to get used again to uh, physical work, being out there doing what in, in your movie you had uh, Chinese people doing that. It's getting back to the idea that that's a dignified, damn good thing to do. And um, it's taken me, uh, I am basically a lazy person, it's taken me some years before I uh, am ready to uh, take that on. And just because of the sort of excitement of seeing Al Gore, other people, and yourself come through with stuff like this, it does seem like we've got a real change coming. Okay. So that wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it, was, it was a comment on... Yeah. Um, not that I... May I just respond momentarily? Um, I think Al Gore has done a tremendous job of convincing people that climate change is equals carbon <coughs> disequilibrium. But unfortunately, climate change is not simply carbon disequilibrium. So that, that is a little bit of a problem with, and he's moved on. I, I, I was on the share the stage with him at one point. I certainly agree that yeah. climate change is more Yeah. But the movie was primarily carbon disequilibrium. John, the, China is currently terribly important to this country's economy because it is buying hugely from our quarry, all of our quarries. Um, are you, though, saying that with the Lewis um, example that you've given us, that China, in fact, is a model for this country to follow? <laughs> no, not exactly. Um, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm feeling myself is that we often think of us and them, but it doesn't really work with me because my father's Chinese, my mother's American of Scottish descent, and my wife is German, and you know, I don't really feel like that. So what I have kind of felt like is there's just us. and we need to realize that we are a species and the things which are the same about human beings are much greater than the things which are different about human beings. And the fact is that we need to react this way. And we need the qualities, the cultural qualities, the intellectual qualities, the physical qualities of all the people on the earth to go in a certain direction. So I've, I've been looking at it from the, to how, what are human beings? What are, what are our motivations? What are we like? And, I, and in, in studying natural systems, I see two possibilities. One is we're parasitic epiphytes that are about to consume our host. And when we consume our host, we're going to die. So that's one. I don't like that one. I mean, I kind of like epiphytes, but you know, they're in, 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 a, in a jungle situation, they're quite charming, you know. But, and, but the other possibility is that we are evolutionary beings, and there's something extraordinary about human beings, and that we have a unique evolutionary role to play. And, that this is connected to our consciousness. And so most other species don't have this ability to consider abstract time or understand our own death or 
have such complex language abilities. And so that seems to be our niche, our ecological niche. But if we, if we act as if production and consumption of goods and services and our purpose is to go shopping, then I don't think that we have fully evolved. And I don't think that we will necessarily fully evolve when we can all say ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services, but I think it's definitely a step further. <laughs> And that if we get to that step, we will be on a pathway which leads to restoration of all the degraded ecosystems. Because if you look at the east coast of the United States, it was completely deforested. And now it's beautiful. But instead of thinking when the United States was doing that, that, well, we should do that all over the world, they thought, let's do that for us. And, you know, people in Ethiopia or you know, somewhere, Sudan, Somalia, Central Asia, whatever, doesn't matter. Well, that's not true, because we live on the earth, and we're all interconnected, and we share the same air and the same oceans. So we're, we have to restore those. It's a degraded area somewhere. It's a degraded area everywhere. So no, I don't think we have to study the Chinese as, as a model we have to work together with the Chinese because they're not planning to go away. <laughs> and John, have, have we got time to embrace your mantra and afford all the systems collapse? Well, I don't think it matters. We have to, we need to do this anyway. Because, um, you know, I, I think those of us who are alive today have a responsibility. If we take our responsibility, it seems that this is one way to do it. So in, in, in the absence of a better idea, then I think this is the one we need to go with. So if, we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if, if, if you think cap and trade or, or this or that is going to work, then well, maybe that's a, a, an option. But I don't see that at all. I don't want to be rude. What you're saying is totally correct. The biggest question I've got is how. How can we do this? Uh, yeah, that's nice. Um, <laughs> uh, I should give. I should have given my. I, I would never be a prophet speech because I have one inspired by Garrison Keillor. It's true, but um, basically, I don't get to decide. Um, and I had several sessions with the Society for Organizational Learning before I understood that. And now that I understand it, I feel a lot better. But it also means that you have a responsibility <laughs> and everybody has a responsibility. And so the question is, how do we do this? And the we is the really big we. It's not the we in the West or the we in the Wall Street, or we the disenfranchised. It's we human beings. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was interested in your mention of Marx, because just recently I've been reading about Karl Marx's um, ecological um, perspectives and, and how he was really worried early on about how capitalism was destroying the soil quality in England and various places. And um, I just wondered why, you know, you mentioned the comment about, um, you know, those states, Eastern European Russian states, not being uh, communist states. And I mean, Marx argued strongly that we need to change the system if we're going to, you know, be able to hand on our environment in a better state for future generations and he was saying that we need to um, to really uh, mobilize people and, and change our system into a more democratic system I'm just wondering if, how much you think you know democracy is key to changing things like real participatory democracy well I think that that's a great idea um, and but having lived for 32 years in China and been to all those communist countries, 
you know, they weren't the most democratic places I've ever seen. And uh, the idea that a totalitarian regime is somehow more effective than a democratic one is, you know, seems wrong <laughs> to me because I mean I've seen I've seen communes where nobody did anything because nobody wanted to do more than the other person. So, you know, we need heroic efforts at this point, not the lowest common denominator. We need people to step up and say, we're going to do this, whether anybody else does it or not, because this is what we have to do. And so there will be early adopters. There will be people who won't catch on. But I think if, if you get to the point where everyone can say, or many, many people, maybe just critical mass, whatever critical mass is. So, I mean, we have to think very seriously about this financial crisis. And I, I'm not a big fan of Karl Marx. I mean, I think he, you know, he, he was thinking. But I also think that we shouldn't burn his books or, or you know, not consider his thinking. I think that's part of human thought. And we better consider what he was talking about, as we should everybody. And, you know, if it's just drivel, well, let's discard it. But if it's got some grain of truth, then let's consider it. And, you know, everybody, we should, we, we should be open to this. That's what intellectual freedom is about. If we say that we, we can't, we, we have a dogma and we're afraid to, to, to consider him, then that's ridiculous. It's, it seems to me that what you've done has had an enormous impact in, on very large areas and in, and in countries. Have you had the opportunity to speak to the governments and politicians of other countries? And of course, it would be fantastic if you could speak to the Australian government. <laughs> <laughs> but the argument strikes me that if people, people at the ground level continue to spread this message, but also if, if, um, if your message was heard at the political level, um, that would be fantastic as well. Well, I, I've been doing my best. Um, sometimes people have said, well, I wonder why this isn't just taking off, you know? Why, why, why isn't everybody just thinking and doing this? And I, you know, my only answer is, I guess I'm a terrible communicator. Uh, but <laughs> but um, I have spoken at Wilton Park, in the UK, I've spoken twice to the Royal Society, I've spoken at the World Bank in, in Washington, I've spoken at a number of universities, I've actually spoken at Parliament House in Canberra uh, at the National Business Leaders Conference on Sustainable Development, and many other places around. We're in SEAD, the top business school in Europe and so on. Um, building upon the one you just got asked, really, um, how did it feel after Copenhagen? <laughs> how did I feel? How did it feel in general? Well, I felt fine. Um, I felt just the same as before Copenhagen. I thought that the political leaders had no clue what was going on, and the chance of a, some sort of massive agreement was absolutely zero. And we presented a film called Hope in a Changing Climate. I was nobody. And the film was shown all over the place. It's been translated into many languages. And people imagine and see that, and they imagine a way forward that looks viable. And that's much better than some sort of abstraction. Well, I mean, when I look at, say, the carbon markets, for instance, most of the people who are talking and participating in the carbon markets never talk about ecology at all. They talk about money. And so money in their world is derived from production and consumption of goods and services, and billions or trillions will be needed to achieve carbon equilibrium if that's at all possible. And so they plan to control that money. That's what I think is going on. I'll stay as long as they allow us to stay. Okay. Uh, so uh, I can't speak for we the humanity, but I can speak for we the Australians. We have a tendency to shorten things. Uh, people would agree, robots to robot. 
my name is Tisham Koti, it's now Tish. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, so ecosystem function is more valuable than uh, production of goods and services. Production and consumption of goods and services is a rather mouthful. And the other day I was wearing a green and gold t-shirt and I was thinking about green and gold. And I changed it to green is gold. And I think Australians would resonate with that as a motto. That the environment, the green is gold, is money. Well, yes, <laughs> and maybe. <clears throat> I, I think that at the moment, we have to be very careful because we don't need uh, a viral transmission of an impressionistic idea. We need a profound understanding of what's happening and the role of human beings in disrupting natural ecosystems and the potential role of human beings in restoring them. So I think that ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than <laughs> production and consumption of goods and services. And I think that by saying it that way, then even if they don't understand it in the very beginning, Gradually, they're going to wonder, well, what did I just say? <laughs> what ecosystem function is vastly, oh. And gradually, if they repeat that about 20 times, I think they're going to understand it. You do all realize you're going to have to say, you know, yeah. I, I want to add one thing. Um, a lot of people talk about ecosystem services. It's part of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. But actually, services are anthropogenic. We are extracting the services from functional systems. We don't need services. We need function. If we have functional systems, we'll have the services we need. But if we insist on services, we could destroy the function, and then we won't have anything. So just a, a minor clarification. So I. I I, I think, you know, it's, we live in a marketing world and everything, but I think we need to go to some profound understanding. Uh, I, I can't imagine that anybody in this room disagrees with a word that you said, um, because otherwise we wouldn't be here, I guess, unless we just wanted to argue. But, uh, uh, look, uh, what you're saying is, is, is so undeniably true, and yet it hasn't filtered through to very to, to higher levels. Uh, and we saw in Copenhagen leaders trying to wrestle with a, a subject they didn't really understand, I think, um, which is the, the message you're giving here tonight, fundamentally. Um, I, I, uh, I wonder, can, can we imagine what it would be like walking into a G20 meeting and talking like this? I think uh, people would simply uh, panic or turn off or, I mean, I can't imagine that, that they would be on the, the right wavelength. And it seems to me that this is a, a real paradigm issue and it's at the high level, it's at, at the top, um, that, that we cannot break through um, to, the, to the top. That's the problem. Let me, let me suggest something here. For many years, and even decades, the environmental movement has been kind of fascinated with dysfunction. We've looked at the pollution. We've looked at uh, different aspects of, and it, it's very, very important. All of this work is very, very important. But we need to turn away from the dysfunction. That we need to accept that the dysfunction is real and not deny it. But we need to work on solutions and see past the, the great disruption or see past the, the dysfunction. And I think 
if in, in studying dysfunctional systems, I've been to a lot of dysfunctional systems, and I found that I really had to go to the most beautiful places on earth and see what the functional systems looked like. Because the dysfunctional systems are, are horrible. And when you go to the natural systems, and there are many, so I've been to Ecuador, to Tipitini, to Guyana, to the Iwakrama, to in the largest uh, mountainous forest in the Albertine Rift in, in, in Africa and up in the uh, plateau in Mongolia, the steppe in Mongolia. And these places are perfect. And the, the evolutionary trends are still present. Nothing's, nothing's interrupting them. Now, if you plow up the perennial grasses on the Mongolian steppe, you'll destroy it and create a desert. Or if you cut down the rainforest that's remaining here or there, you'll get a terrible result. So we need to look at that and say, well, these are all very valuable. And then, and protect them. But then we need to look around and say, oh my goodness, at least a quarter, maybe a third or more of the earth has been massively degraded. And we need jobs. I wonder what people should be doing. Uh, you know, we need economic growth. Well, if ecosystem function is the basis of the economy, then to restore ecosystems is to have continuous e ecosystem growth until we max out. So that's not too bad. And you know, at the end of that, we have a fully functional planet. Wow. Uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the things that makes us human is the fact that we think and project. And uh, I wonder if it's one of the uh, fallacies of the human condition that we don't really have until things quite us in the rear. And in regards to that, one of the practicalities you mentioned in your talk was the fact that population is really becoming a burden for the planet. I was just wondering how you would uh, approach the Pope in regards to contraception. <laughs> well, I, I, I have a feeling that I'm not going to have the opportunity to, <laughs> to talk directly to the Pope. I, I can only think of my airplane joke. When there are four passengers on an airplane, one is the President of the United States, one is Henry Kissinger, one is the Pope, and one is a hippie. And the pilot comes on the public address system and says, quickly, look around you, find a parachute and put it on because the plane's about to crash. So the President takes one, he says, I am the President of the United States, I must be saved, he puts it on and jumps out. And then Henry Kissinger grabs one, and he says, I am the smartest man in the world. I must be saved. Puts it on and jumps out. And that leaves the Pope and the hippie. And the Pope says, I am old, and you are young, my son. You take the last remaining parachute and save yourself. And the hippie says, it's OK, Pope. The smart one took my backpack. <laughs>
We are so ripped. <laughs> I didn't even stumble over that. If you would like to make a donation to assist with the ongoing presentation of wonderful speakers, um, we would really welcome your donations, both small and large. So, um, my um, very warm thanks for your presence here tonight, but don't go quite yet because Cam Jones, who is Richard Jones' son, will um, say some things and make a presentation. Um, don't worry, everybody, I won't keep you very long. John, I'm very pleased to have been uh, asked to thank you for speaking to us tonight. Your lecture has been a very interesting and uh, thought-provoking exploration of some of the issues facing us globally at the moment. It's also been at a uh, local level as we consider such issues as the introduction of a carbon tax, which could be described as placing a value on the cost of the environment of production and consumption, and our uh, recent increase to a population mark of 7 billion, which brings into sharp focus our need to live in a sustainable manner. John, thank you very much for coming to speak to us tonight. Please accept this small gift as a token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. presentation of the Be the Change Symposium um, at, uh, on Friday the 11th of November, that's this Friday, 5.30pm to 9.30pm at the Philip Smith Centre. And um, I can speak from the heart on this that this is a presentation that will be completely consistent with what John has been speaking about and will bring you to a point where you will um, feel inspired to engage in the Tasmanian part of this picture. And thank you very much for presenting us with both hope and challenge. Thank you, go well, and go well.